Good afternoon. Um, I don't know if I need to hit the gavel or not, but there we go. We're starting. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the October 20th, 2022 Policy Management Committee meeting. Uh, this is our first meeting of the school year, and we are joined today for the first time ever by our new student board member, Arvin Kim, and we want to say welcome to start off. So welcome to Policy Management. Um, so we've got several things to go over today and work on today, some exciting stuff, um, but I will start with our informational summary. Um, actually, I'm going to start with everybody introducing themselves. Apologize. Um, Ms. Evans, would you like to go first? Good afternoon, everyone. Shebra Evans. Good afternoon, Arvin Kim. Good afternoon, Judy Daka. Oh, I went the wrong way. Oh, no, Sorry. totally fine. You're, yeah. Very good. Does staff want to introduce? Good afternoon, Heather Dublinski. Good afternoon, Stephanie Williams, General Counsel. Good afternoon, Sally Davis, off to the General Counsel. Mm -hmm. Victoria Van Dyke, Board Staff. Robin Seabrook, Board Staff. Wonderful. Well, welcome everybody and welcome to those in the audience. Um, I will now start with our informational summary um, and ask if anybody has any questions, comments, concerns. No. Okay, so approved then. Um, item number three um, is the uh, our work plan and the approval of our work plan. Um, the full board worked very hard this year to ensure that um, all of our annual work plans um, for each of our committees were aligned with the board's annual priorities and the priorities set forth in our strategic plan. Um, in a in addition to taking a look for policy management, in addition to taking a look at some um, new areas, our annual plan includes the continuation of policy development that was already in the works from last year and a few legally mandated and policy driven updates that are required. With that, I will turn it over to Ms. Davis to walk us through the annual work plan. Sure. And to TV, we will be on that item next. Just a second, please. We can take down the slideshow. Okay. So um, as we work our way through the work plan, you'll notice that we are carrying over two items in process. Policy ABA community involvement has been out for public comments since April. We will leave it out until November 4th. And then uh, the board has requested that staff analyze policy ABA community involvement along with ABC parent and family involvement to um, suggest uh, merging the two and staff are working on that and we will bring you some analysis of that to a later meeting. Okay. Okay. Then uh, last spring the board heard a presentation on policy IGA, school counseling programs and services and at that time, uh, policy management uh, heard suggestions from staff for updating that policy um, to reflect not just school counseling, mm -hmm. but to better reflect the board's priorities more broadly for student mental, social, and emotional health. So staff is working on that, and we, we will bring you that later this year. Now, we will shortly hear the two required annual updates Mm -hmm. um, these will be coming in a minute, the school calendar and the update on the implementation of policy JHC, Child Abuse and Neglect. And then moving on to the new work on the Policy Management Committee work plan um, is shown um, and I will just note that we will be addressing the technical amendments to ACI today. So, uh, and then there is a task referred to this committee by the full board uh, for the development of a new attendance policy. Staff are working on this now, mm -hmm. and we will bring this to you later in the year. And, and then, of course, it is gratifying to see the completion mm -hmm. <laughs> of some of the substantial policy revisions done by this committee last year. So mm -hmm. at this point, I defer to you, Mrs. Smodrowski, how you'd like to proceed. Okay. Um, we don't need to vote on this since we voted as a full board. Is that correct? Okay. I just wanted to uh, see if my colleagues had any kind of questions or comments or anything that they wanted to say or speak to in reference to the the work plan. Yeah. Um, this is Shebra, so the work plan looks great, and I wanted to thank um, Sally and everyone else for the was five um, 
policies that we were able to complete last year. Um, they were really, it was really great work. Um, and so just wanted to acknowledge that and we could continue with the meeting. No, it was great. Yeah, and I too wanna thank you all for the time and everything over the summer that we spent putting this together. Um, so that will, with that, we'll move on to item number four, which is everybody's favorite topic, the uh, discussion of the policy IDA, our school year calendar. Okay. Uh, for background, policy IDA requires that the board adopt a school year calendar by the end of December each year. Um, we begin that process with the presentation of calendar options that you all bring to us. Um, and put together through development of conversations that we've had, you know, over the year. Um, today we're going to review and discuss four calendar options. I'm very excited about the level of community input that's gone into the development of these options. And I also look forward to continuing those efforts for outreach to, and targeting very specific stakeholders to provide feedback um, so everyone has a voice. Um, just for public reference, for next steps, after we provide feedback on these scenarios today, uh, the scenarios that we approve will be presented to the full board on October 25th. The public will then have another opportunity to provide comment when it goes out for public comments, comments and feedback um, before the final action is taken on the calendar. So um, again, I'm, I'm excited about you know these calendars and the work that was done to be able to look at some of these things a little bit differently than maybe we have in the past. Um, uh, Mr. Hollis has worked very hard on this for, I know, and I appreciate it, and I will turn it over to him to discuss what has been put together. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us. And Ms. Mandrowski, thank you for describing this as exciting mm. um, because it definitely is. And I'm very happy to um, be back with the calendar again this year after so many years being away. And we've done some great work as a system in terms of how we put the calendar together, really recognize the instructional time, but also just what are the needs of our community overall so that we can develop something that really best fits our instructional program. Last year, I participated in the calendar in a different way to really think about out of school time opportunities on professional days and early release days. And so this year, I'm really excited and honored to be leading this work um, along with Doug Hollis um, and really looking at it from our approach of how we gathered input. So we did something a little bit different this year where we gathered input initially around people's interest. Um, versus developing the scenario and then asking for feedback about the scenarios. And um, as our district goes through our anti-racist audit findings, one of the things that we learned in terms of really engaging and collaborating was that this is a more respectful way where we honor the diversity of others and really hearing from them first and the purity of their voice and then reflecting that into some type of product. Um, so we hope that we will be able to articulate that to you today. You will see that through many of the options that we present. With that, though, as we talk about it, you'll hear about the three phases of feedback, which will make this a little bit different than what we've done before. And then the second component is this calendar truly emphasizes the board's strategic priorities, um, and particularly the one around engaging the community, but not leaving out the factors of considering equity and whose voices are present and whose voices are absent, and who does this benefit, and who might this impact in a way that we are not really sure of or disadvantage in some way. So as we went through this critically important process in order to develop the scenarios uh, we lead today, we look forward to sharing the work with you and Doug will take you through the extensive process and where we stand as of today. Thank you. Good afternoon, Doug Hollis, um, Office of District Operations. Um, excited to be doing this work um, and, and sharing some of the findings. Um, the calendar is a, a, a labor of love, um, but with that, I, I also say I think it's one of the best jobs and opportunities in the school system because I have so many opportunities to reach out and interact with so many different people from across our school district. And so um, no calendar draft scenario version is perfect, um, but it is our opportunity to at least try to have a process 
uh, that is closer to perfect, uh, that at least allows more voices to be heard. With that, we'll jump right in. Let's go to the next slide. So this slide just really demonstrates the actions and the timeline. Um, really, I'd love to start with last year. And so last year, we adopted the calendar um, in January. Um, and I think we were pleased with that work. We're living through it now. Uh, people are experiencing it. I think um, it's really good to have interactions with folks because when you have these conversations with groups of individuals, um, as they are living it, uh, they'll start to say, why are we doing this again? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that translation is always needed. Um, there's a number of conversations that began in the summer um, with members of this committee, um, but particularly also members of the board office and also MCPS's leadership to really say, what's our strategy? And one of the things, as Dana has already mentioned, and as well as uh, Mrs. Mondrowski, is just the concept of when we went out and did additional feedback um, last year, we got more write-ins than we ever had yeah. um, in terms of, have you thought about this? Why do you do this? And, and as those things came forward, it pushed us to say, huh, we should approach this differently. And so I really just want to highlight on this slide, September 29th through October 13th, um, and then also uh, what will then happen at the end of October. And those are really two opportunities, different than years past, uh, to really hear from uh, the, the community and really our stakeholders. And so we've had a robust period in time here, and we'll share a little bit about what we've heard from people's interest here. Um, but all this will lead us to getting to December 6th, where we will hopefully bring forward uh, a recommendation that is representative of what is operational and structurally sound for MCPS, but also includes the voices of our stakeholders. Um, and so just really wanted to point out those timeline and the actions. Next slide. Here, I just wanted to highlight, um, I think as many of us have become accustomed to, there are some things mandated by the state. Um, in terms of breaks. Um, I also just want to recognize um, this year in our current calendar, we have election day as another holiday. Mm -hmm. That's not included in next year's. Um, so we don't have an election day on odd years. Um, and so that's one of those days where huh, it gives us a little give in our calendar. Um, I also like to acknowledge, and, and we've often talked about it in this committee, um, there are a number of kind of cultural or religious kind of um, observances that occur in our community that we hear oftentimes from students, staff, um, community members, that I think in many ways we found ways that sometimes it aligns with a non-instructional day on our calendar, other times it aligns with the professional development day. Um, I just want to name that for next year, uh, and generally there are about five of those that generally come into play, uh, next year three of those fall on a weekend. Um, and so there's something advantageous about that, um, but at the same time, I don't want us to miss whatever we do one year. Um, mm -hmm. Our community is looking for consistency, and, and so it may become precedent setting, and so something that we may be able to pull off um, this year uh, may be more challenging in future years if we do believe that's a precedent that we should set. And so I just want to note that as well. Next slide. Um, we've had a number of engagement opportunities, and I really just want to point out the people that we really engage with. The calendar committee is really comprised of, I think, about 30 people who work for MCPS. Um, I would say a third of those are in the schools, maybe actually half of them. Half of them are in the schools. Uh, they represent all the different associations, um, principals and teachers and SEIU, SEIU um, staff members as well. Um, at various levels and different places in the school system, as well as a number of offices that work in central office. Um, and those people are critically important to the work because there's just so many factors that we have to consider. Uh, that calendar committee um, is a group that meets on a regular basis. Um, we also have the Innovative School Year Committee, um, and, and that's, that program of those two schools has pulled together representatives from their schools, Roscoe Nitz as well as, Ar uh, as well as Arcola, and they are really having those conversations and meeting on a regular basis to often talk about curriculum and scope and sequence, but also um, how the calendar impacts them. And so they've given rich feedback and received feedback from their community already as well. Um, and then we spoke about the interest survey. 
um, we've had over 18,000 responses. Um, it's, that's a really big number. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I, I really want to thank um, OSI, um, people who have really put it out there and said, how do we make it available? It was out in all eight languages. Um, while the deadline was October 13th, we extended that deadline to October 20th uh, to get more feedback. So the information that we have today really captures us through October 17th. Um, and so when we go to the full board, we will have a full set of that information, but just the opportunities. And then um, Ms. Mondrowski was able to really point out to us and say, how do we target certain communities? Um, and so we've done some of the same work that was done in the anti-race audit in making sure that we took care of uh, communities and said, how do we target and hear voices in, 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 in more appropriate ways? Um, we've even emailed um, some, some students directly. Okay. Um, I think all the juniors and seniors, um, I, I, that's what I was told. So I'm hoping that happened. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Kim, Kim? that happened? <laughs> Hopefully. Can you confirm? Or Check your email. <laughs> He's too busy. <laughs> But, but we, we, we emailed some students directly to get more student input that way as well. Um, and so those pieces are, have been really rich and, and helpful to us. Um, student groups, uh, all of our associations, our parents, um, we've, we've met with a number of them already. We've got others scheduled on the books. Um, this is an ongoing process. So really just want to call out um, the, the richness of the stakeholder engagement um, and, and what it means to us and hope that it continues um, over the next month um, as we get closer to December and bring forward a recommendation. Uh, next slide. Can I just, just to clarify, um, as we continue the uh, outreach, um, because of some of the, there is still some imbalance in terms of percentages of representation, we will make, uh, I just want the community to be aware that we will be making sure that we're very specifically targeting um, specific stakeholder groups. Absolutely, and I think the other way that we attempt to account for that is we do have a lot of small group settings where mm -hmm. as much as I know that the, the quantitative pieces of the surveys really show in, in large ways, the, the qualitative pieces of these small conversations um, are really rich as well yeah. and also show up in a lot of the work we do in Great. feedback, particularly as uh, you as policy management committee may have questions or the board has questions around what are we hearing from folks. Yep. Um, so both of those Perfect. things, absolutely. So this is the, the process that really Dana um, already elevated a little bit around this idea of three phases, um, a, a phase of gathering interest. And, and I've spoke a little bit about the survey, um, and we'll go over the results in one moment here. Um, and then um, we've that led us to uh, developing scenarios. And, and what I'll say about the development of scenarios is this has been a workshopping kind of process. Um, what I wanted to do is, based on the interest, I wanted to start to show groups features, elements of the calendar. And, and when I say that, really I would say the big ones are, when does the school year start? Mm -hmm. When are the breaks? And one of the things that has been elevated and we have in our interest survey is really around Thanksgiving break. Is that one week? Could we make it one week? What mm -hmm. does that feel like to people? What about winter break? Could we make it two weeks? What does that feel like? What are the impacts of that? And so we've workshopped that. And as much as we tried to workshop those things, we got to a point where we said, okay, you heard our interest. I need you to actually put those in a scenario, though. Right. And so that has been part of the challenging work at the last hour here. Um, and so that is what we have done because what needs to take place for us to be able to have a really good conversation and move forward and also for the communities to weigh in is show me an actionable kind of scenario right. um, instead of showing me a lot of different pieces. Yeah. And so we're there now um, and we've done that and developed some scenarios and then the next stage is how we continue to receive feedback. And that will be in these small groups as I've mentioned but also um, an opportunity once we've gone to full board based on the direction we receive here um, to put out something to the public um, to really say what do you think about these scenarios. Um, so that's kind of the process, the three phases and how we'll work through that. Yeah, I just wanted to share with my colleagues as well. So last year, um, uh, Mr. Hollis and I started our conversations about um, this coming calendar and really trying to look at um, something that's a little bit, you know, kind of 
further uh, away from our traditional calendar to open up more opportunities for us to be able to take some longer breaks here and there. Um, I think Mr. Ellis did a phenomenal job of representing the different stages of opportunities. And of course, we are welcome to make adjustments to calendars that we see things we like, not of others if we don't. So. So we'll go to the next slide, which really begins to show some of the feedback from the survey. Um, there were six questions. The first two questions are demographic questions, really trying to figure out who has responded to the survey. Um, and then uh, for those who wanted to complete question two uh, around their ethnicity, that's, that was provided. And that really speaks to some of the additional efforts that we've made when we started to see it. We know that those numbers are not representative percentages. Um, of our school district and so we wanted to make sure we began to target some of the groups that we did not see as many responses from. Yeah, um, question three, four, five, and six really get into the heart of the matter I think of some of these different interests um, that we will begin to tease out a little bit in, ca in calendar scenarios. Um, question three really asked the question, um, we had heard feedback around um, particularly because of the region we were in um, some of the federal holidays, particularly uh, Indigenous People Day and Veterans Day, um, and us not having those days off. Mm -hmm. um, and so we put it out there to the public. You'll see the responses. There is a kind of an even spread there in some ways. Um, you'll see that um, the highest response rate is both. We should recognize both of those days as off. Um, I think we as a school system also know that when you begin to recognize everything, it becomes very challenging and people begin to say, when is instruction occurring? Mm -hmm. um, but it is something that we're hearing. Um, and if we look at Veterans Day versus Indigenous People Day for those individuals who chose just one, you will see that Veterans Day um, seemed to be something that more people were interested in, in terms of us acknowledging. Question four um, really speaks to um, <clears throat> how do we handle some of the, I would say, cultural or religious observances uh, mm -hmm. that I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and more and more we're starting to hear people say they all should be non-instructional days. Um, I think this does challenge um, the window of time in which we are used to the school year spanning. Um, and so that really is something that we have to consider but you'll see that there's a majority of the folks who say that um, we should treat them all as non-instructional as part of the feedback. And then question five is the really cool one, and, and I want to call this the, the Mrs. Mondrowski, um kind of nudge here because in many ways um, she was pushing and said, what's out there, what are people saying that I'm really interested in that's different than what we've done? And so really this is the one that asked the question around, should we have a longer winter break? or should we have even a full week off for Thanksgiving? Um, and so you'll see uh, the responses there. A uh, longer winter break of them all is the one that received the most res most percentage response there. Um, but we also see that there's some interest there possibly in uh, more frequent shorter breaks throughout the year. Um, but you'll see it's kind of spread evenly towards um, once you get past the winter break response. Um, and then finally, question six, um, is now everyone says we should have all these days off. We ask the question, so how do I deal with the impact of that? Um, can I start school a little earlier? Um, can I go a little later? Um, and so this one, once again, kind of even response. Um, our, our, our community is consistent here, um, but I will say that the, the greatest amount or greatest percentage there is starting a little earlier, um, and so up to three days earlier. So that's what we have there. Um, and just really wanted to highlight those. I'll pause and just see if there's any questions about just the survey responses. Do any of you have any or comments? Comments or, yeah. um, or anything like that? I, there are a couple things that I'm not sure if you're going to be adding them in, but just again for kind of reference, um, you know, um, one of the things that I had um, also asked Mr. Hollis to look into um, in the presentations of or in the preparation of these calendars was, you know, making sure that um, impacts of making changes like this to um, pay or um, benefits um, for staff, uh, sports being impacted in any way, shape or form, um, looking at what other systems do when they start and stuff. Um, and again, I'd kind of asked him to look at even maybe a week starting a week earlier or a week later, going a week later, so that um, 
we can really try and fit in the things that people are responding that they are interested in seeing so yeah so that's kind of where we're at yep. all right so let's get into some scenarios and and uh, next slide next slide this really is a summary of, of, of what what I think you you actually began to to, to speak to, which is the balancing and what we're trying to do. So the results of the survey is often a key consideration of us. Um, there's this piece of like highlighting uh, the interest and features versus actionable scenarios, which I mentioned earlier. And so we've gotten to the point where we have some scenarios for us really to dig into. Um, but this idea of commitment to providing both uh, student instructional days, that 182 days that we as MCPS have been committed to for a number of years now, um, but also balancing that with professional development opportunities. Um, how do you do those things? Uh, the continuity of instruction and then opportunities to recharge. Yeah. We heard that so much last year, particularly from students mm -hmm. and staff. Um, this idea of recharging and recharging sometimes tied to travel. Okay. Um, and, and so this concept of every now and then we would have a holiday and the question of, can't we just have the day after that off too or <laughs> exactly. the day before? Um, and, and, and a lot of times we heard from families the idea and concept of um, travel was something important or even just I need to come down off of my great celebratory time in that <laughs> holiday, right? And so we understand those notions, but that, that's just something that we're trying to balance here. Um, and then we have um, considerations of, you know, the, the innovative school year, um, how we have increased the amount of, of what we do in the summer with ESY as well as just other summer opportunities. Um, so how do you balance those things? Um, there's a sweet spot. For, for those folks. Innovative you know, school year has 30 additional days. They normally do those in the summer. Um, and that is where the, really the add-on and them getting to at least 210 um, really occurs for them. But also even our summer school programs, particularly the credit ones, um, we, have, we need about six weeks um, consecutively um, for those things to happen. And so sometimes shrinking the summer may impact that as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then benchmarking with other school districts. Um, you know, we, we've got some school districts that started really, really early. Um, we've got some other school districts that did different things. But I also want us to think about, um, you, you know, our community lives in such a broad way. Mm -hmm. um, and many people work here but live somewhere else mm -hmm. and have students in other school districts. We have many people who do... It, there's just so many different things to think about. And so it is good to be close to and near other school districts. I will say this school year, when we looked at what MSDE provided for all the school districts, um, most schools started um, around the same time that we did. And almost everybody is getting out by the end of the second week of June. Um, so that seems to be a sweet spot in Maryland. Um, and so we try our best to do that as well. But the other piece here is just the equitable approach. Um, the idea of if I give two weeks off, does that mean something different for someone's paycheck? Um, you know, does that mean something different um, for people who actually don't travel and work all the time and need some kind of um, child care provided for them? Mm -hmm. And so those are the pieces that we have to continue to tease out. Um, but now we'll look at the four different uh, scenarios that we have. Um, Shepard. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, thank you for the key considerations because mm -hmm. as you speak to them, it makes me really think about um, who we weren't able to reach, right? right? Absolutely. And really um, yeah. continue to make a concerted effort to try to reach out to them. And then I am interested to know why we only have 7% students, right? Um, that's not really that much. <laughs> and so um, as we talk about wanting longer breaks, because guess what, I would love to have it, right? Um, there are a lot of factors that come into play if we put that into place. So I just want to make sure that our community really, um, we do, we, we always make a concerted effort to make sure that we keep um, our information out there for the community to comment on, but we don't always hear from the, the communities that we need to mm -hmm. hear from. And then after something, after a policy goes into effect, is when you hear the most impacted communities talk about, we had no idea, we didn't know. Mm -hmm. So um, as we consider considering um, extending the winter break or 
having um, given thought to a longer Thanksgiving break or starting earlier, I really, really want to make sure that we are um, getting out to our communities to make sure that it's just not um, correct. 7% of our students responding. Um, I did see where we had a good bit of parents responding, but that um, our staff responds as well, right? Mm -hmm. So I just yeah. wanted to highlight mm -hmm. that. You've done a great job at really pointing out the things that we should consider, but I just really, really want our um, community to be able to comment more. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we discussed that actually last week a little bit, and I don't know if you want to speak for a minute on to the specific efforts that we had asked about trying to target things. Now, you did say that you sent something out to our students. And, and I just want to say this. And so as I'm talking and commenting, yeah. I'm not saying to staff, you're not doing a great job. <laughs> it's like, you no, know, I make this assumption that everybody is watching this committee <laughs> meeting, which they probably are not, to say if they you hear us be. talking, right. right, they should. Actually, they should. Right, that if you hear us talking, like, please, please, please make a comment. Mm -hmm. Give us your feedback mm -hmm. because this will have a lasting impact. So right. that's all. So I and just as, wanted to, yeah, as I had said there. to Mr. Hollis, um, you know, if, if you want your voice to count, you're gonna, you gotta kind of provide the feedback. So um, hopefully, people will do that. Is the survey still open? So the survey is Currently? supposed to close tonight. Okay. Um, but you know, we'll be done with this meeting before tonight. So if right. you if you're directing me differently, then okay. then we can consider some other ways of doing that. Okay. Or we still have time for public comment. So, you know, and we still will have public absolutely. comment. It's going to go days. back out yeah. right. when people get Correct. the feedback yes. that has been taken from the absolutely. community is when you hear from the people that you probably hadn't heard from, but it's <laughs> yes. the people that we really need to hear from. So, <laughs> yes. I'll say exactly. that. Yeah. Um, I think Ms. Evans makes a really good point when she says that when this happens, we have reached out to as many people as we could, and then others say, well, I didn't know that was going to happen, and we're going to hear about it. And I've been here long enough to know that at one time we had 12 days uh, for in-service. People went absolutely mad about that. They did not like it. So then it cut it back to about four days. And so now we're looking at it again. And, I, I'm, and I'm concerned about the summer extending the, mm, having the six weeks in the summer and then having school closed so close to those. It's no, no time for people to recharge. So I, I don't know. We just have to think about all of that. And we did mention, um, Ms. Ride mentioned our um, community involvement policy, which is still mm -hmm. in the works, but that also is um, our intention to mm -hmm. engage in um, more creative ways, right? Um, so I know that we're trying to make every effort through all of the work that we're doing to look at everything through an equity lens. And so this is not me saying the system is not doing that. It's just saying that we really, really, 7% um, well, sure student feedback is not enough for me. Agreed. And um, when we look at and the breakout break down of, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, by race, yep. right? Correct. We, we are not hearing from... Um, right the populations that we did discuss a few um, ways of really trying to target and even utilizing some of the groups that um, we worked with for um, the anti-racist audit um, to help target some more of these uh, specific stakeholders okay. so I you know the intention is to definitely to do that sure okay. next slide So here we will begin with scenario A. Um, so this is uh, the first of four scenarios we'll put before you. Um, the two big highlights that I would say for this scenario is when school starts. Uh, this is starting a week earlier. Uh, generally we start uh, school uh, the last few years, uh, the last Monday in August. This one has us on August the 21st. That's a full week earlier mm -hmm. um, with pre-service uh, obviously preceding that. Um, and then the other large piece here is our attempt at what does it look like if we had two weeks off for winter break? Mm -hmm. um, and so what you'll see is a, a number of different colors, uh, holiday system-wide closures, as well as non-instructional days mm -hmm. in that last week of December and that first week of January. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are the big elements um, of this. Uh, the other piece that we want to just really point out um, is um, in all of our scenarios, you will see a number of light pink days, um, which are professional development days. And it's really something that we want 
um, to really show our commitment to staff. I think last year, um, one of the things we saw was uh, the addition, and we're living through it a little bit in this school calendar of early release days to try mm -hmm. to provide some professional development. And so I think we're still workshopping this, but in many ways we're looking at the opportunity to have more professional development days, if at all possible. Um, and if that impacts, um, you know, the number of duty days or other things of that nature, or even number of calendar days, one of the things that we are also exploring with the state is are there other opportunities uh, for some of those professional development days to be counted um, as instructional days if we're able to provide something for our students. And so that's something that, that Dr. McKnight um, and her executive leadership team are exploring and having conversations with the state. Um, but it's also something that we're just curious about mm -hmm. um, as the, you know, the public sees a scenario such as this uh, and how they may respond to it. So that's scenario A. Um, next slide. Scenario B, um, same start time, but instead of having two weeks off for winter break, you'll see this scenario has this uh, second to last week in November as completely off, and that is where <coughs> Thanksgiving um, aligns. So November 20th through the 24th, and that would be showing one week off. Um, and I do want to point out, and I didn't make mention of it in the last one, um, but in scenario A, um, we're not getting out at some crazy late date right. by, by doing that. Um, we were able to still um, provide an opportunity for folks to get out by the 13th of June in scenario A. And then here um, in scenario B, kind of flipping that, you'll see that we're getting out um, on June the 11th. And so one week early, but then this shows Thanksgiving break off. Um, and so that just shows a different variation. Those same light pink days that I mentioned before um, are also here uh, as well as, as I, I made note of them in our last uh, slide. Just uh, really yeah. quickly, um, I know I briefly touched on it, but for sports, I just want people to understand also as we're looking that you have worked with um, uh, Jess Sullivan, who is you know the head of our athletics department, and the or starting earlier would not have any kind of negative effect on sports. Right. So it has no negative impact on sports, and um, there's a lot of folks in our community who say it would have a positive impact on instruction as well. Correct. And so what I would say is, for us in the state of Maryland, based on when we can begin to start the sports season, and Jeff quotes it like a Bible, I don't know it exactly, <laughs> I know. but I know the earlier we start actually is right. beneficial um, right. to us. Um, from the instructional lens, um, for those students, as we think about our standardized test, yes. as we think about AP tests, IB mm -hmm. tests, all those assessments, mm -hmm. um, it, it does then give us potentially mm -hmm. another week or so. Um, of, of instruction that could have occurred mm -hmm. before students get there. And so when we think about our students, if they are competing or our grades are being compared mm -hmm. um, against other school system, it does put us in a different place in terms of if we started earlier, uh, potentially, if we are able to really uh, galvanize and really take advantage of that. Yeah, I know that was a huge concern for a lot of parents in terms of starting late when the whole thing with the governor's uh, mandate was going through that was a big issue so this is good points so then the last next slide the next scenario scenario C um, so this one um, a little different go back one please TV thank you um, scenario C um, instead of starting a full week early it starts us two days early so it is a midweek start. It's a Thursday start um, on the 24th of August. Um, Pre-service then would be a midweek start as well, preceding it. Um, but it would give an opportunity, and as some of uh, some principals and members of MCEA have said in our committee meeting, it's almost like an opportunity to get your feet wet. Mm -hmm. You get in there and you do two days. You can go over some of the, the protocol and procedural aspects of mm -hmm. school. Then you can take a break for a weekend and gather yourself and begin stru instruction solidly mm -hmm. uh, beginning the next week. And so that is, um, and I think that's in some ways, and I haven't had a chance, I will be meeting with a group of students tonight, um, but um, I think some students have probably articulated, 
yeah, it's a lot to just jump right back in and do a full week of school. Mm -hmm. So it's something to think about. Um, and it's another option. We wanted to present that. Um, that is the only thing that is drastically unique about this scenario. It just has a starting two days earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so not a full week earlier, but just two days earlier. Um, and then our breaks uh, around Thanksgiving, around winter break, um, all our holidays, professional development days, all that is fairly standard with what we've traditionally be, been doing um, in our school system. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just want to highlight that one. And then the last slide, next slide, is scenario D. And this one um, is very similar to scenario C. The difference here is this shows the traditional start date. Mm -hmm. So this would show us starting on August the 28th. Um, which is that last Monday in August, and all those other pieces um, are very similar or the same. Uh, this one showing the traditional start date um, does show us getting out of school um, a little later there, um, but at the same time, it's still within the second week of June, um, so we still are landing on June the 14th, um, which is something that we have done before. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not drastically different than anything else. Yep. It's just later than these other two scenarios, other three scenarios show. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the scenarios. Um, and, and I know you all um, didn't receive all these details really early. So I, I, I do welcome any discussion, conversations about any of them. Um, before I turn over to my colleagues, I did want to point out one thing that um, you, you didn't necessarily spotlight when you were discussing it, but like on uh, calendar B, scenario B, for example, um, in February, uh, providing a, a an extended break, uh, long weekend, essentially, five-day five weekend um, in the middle of February to give people, you know, kind of a, a little break from the, the mundane, you know, because there's a, it's kind of a long stretch there. Um, in February and March in terms of having any time to recoup. And, and it works there in that scenario, mm -hmm. and it probably will work in most of these scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, I just d demonstrated it there, and I appreciate you highlighting that. Um, one of the things as we look at neighboring districts, um, there are some districts that do a full week off um, mm -hmm. around President's Day. Um, <laughs> D.C. has a mini break um, during that, that period in time. Mm -hmm. um, but we also, part of the feedback, I think around the two weeks off for winter break is just around the concept of, whew, yeah. it's just, it's cold. And if I could have a little break time, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that would be helpful. Yep. Yeah. So I will open it up to my colleagues to provide thoughts. Um, again, I just kind of want to reiterate that we do not need to send all four calendars to the full board if we don't want to. We can narrow it down to, to three um, if we think that that's better. We've done that in years past. Um, we also, if you've got thoughts on days that, or aspects of one calendar that you really like, that, but maybe not the whole calendar, but you'd like to see if it's possible to, um, so for example, with that five-day week, uh, five-day weekend, um, in scenario B, you would like to talk about ways of including that in scenario A, for example, we can, or, you know, any of the other scenarios. Those are things that we can also uh, talk about. So while we're, I'm letting them take a look at it. Um, no? No? That's, okay. Um, yeah, I just want to remind everyone that, you know, um, in terms of just the uh, calendar D uh, for scenario D, with the more traditional style calendar, it does not incorporate, it's missing three days that the following year will need to be considered for being off and um, for different observances that are this in this calendar year going to be falling on the weekends. So... Um, <coughs> So I am open to thoughts. You said three additional days. Are, it, would one be the election? Is well, that, no. So, for example, like Eid is, I think, on a Saturday oh, this the, week, uh, this calendar gotcha. year. And Diwali Day, I think, is also on a week, Sunday. On a Sunday. Um, and one of the Jewish holidays is um, also on a weekend. So, 
you know, if we go with the, so the, next, year. the next year, those we'll have yeah, to incorporate them into the calendar somehow. Right. So. Yeah, and you did mention at the very beginning that there were three mm -hmm. holidays that were going to fall on the weekend yeah. this year and that our community As has. As opposed to five, okay. yeah. yeah, that were normally in the week school week. My life's still on. So I was, yeah, till I got, I'm going back and forth. I was thinking about um, calendar B. Calendar B is the one in February you have a professional day and then a non-instructional day. And then the Monday is the holiday, right? Correct. And if we took just that um, non-instructional day in February and we added it to calendar C, does that... Would that um, extend the school year by a day? And so basically, seeing that same kind of layout, mm -hmm. but seeing it on on C. Yes. Yeah, it, it it would just push. There's no. It would just push the school year a day. A day. Okay. Mm -hmm. And one other thing that I had kind of looked at was. Um, they all get so confusing after a while. <laughs> um, so I, I really like the concept of the starting the two days and giving people that kind of kickstart, as Mr. Hollis referred to it as. Um, but I also like the five-day weekend in February for people to have a little bit of a, a breather, a non-traditional break. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I had thought about was looking at in calendar A, potentially removing maybe um, one or two of the days after the new year. And so it's more of a, not a full two weeks, but just shy and, <clears throat> and maybe moving the, um, the start date two days earlier. So we would start on the 17th instead of the 21st for, to provide that two day that you all were talking about, and then adding in the five-day weekend. I don't know if that's, if, so the, maybe that's too much. So then that pushes pre-service like a week. So that means- Two like, days. Well, two days, so that means that they will be starting at the end of the second week of, mm -hmm. towards the end of the second week in that's, August. That's correct, and then NEO would start even earlier, the new right. educator orientation. Yeah, I think. And Ms. Mandrowski, you're saying take two of the non-instructional well, days in January? I'm just tossing around mm -hmm. like ways of, because um, we didn't really have enough time ahead of time to kind of tease out some what some of the mm -hmm. other options might be, but um, a way of kind of combining like scenario uh, C and scenario B to be able to, um, but with the, you know, the two, which is the one that has the two extra. <laughs> the kickoff day is, here, yeah, scenario C and scenario B. So basically just kind of looking at a way that um, we can add one extra day potentially off on um, in February. Mm -hmm. Or if we, even if we just moved the last day in June over one, we could still keep that whole thing and then add a day, the extra day in February. I don't know what anybody's thoughts are on that. I'm confused now. <laughs> it doesn't matter, okay. it's okay. But you know what I wanted to say? Typically what we do do in this committee is, um, or what happens, because yes. this is my first um, calendar. in previous year in mm -hmm. calendar, um, this is my first time being on the policy committee with the calendar coming forward, is we do narrow down the calendars Correct. to bring forward to the full board. But you know what? I actually want to take them all to the full board. Okay. I, this is the first time that you all have ever um, did some really creative yeah. things in the calendar. And so I do want um, to um, have a full board discussion yeah, where we've, um, we're showing how it could look if we have a full week off for the week of spring break, mm -hmm. where we have changed it to early release days. Right. Um, the full week of Thanksgiving. It, and then we've extended the winter, winter break yes. into January yep. and added the professional mm -hmm. days. I'm very comfortable. The non-instructional day, I'm saying, in With February. that as well, because so. I am very excited about these, as I said from the beginning. I, no, this is really This good. is something that we've been talking about for a lot of years, and 
like I said, after last year's calendar room, and then we making made some adjustments to allow some uh, system closure days um, to this year's calendar, mm -hmm. and um, or I mean to last year's calendar, and so we started talking about like looking at things yep. differently. So I'm I'm very comfortable if, if everybody want agrees and wants to t send all four. I always say that too. It'll it be a way to yeah. have a really um, enriched discussion with all of our colleagues, yep. um, and then have people to really consider the key considerations. Yes. Um, yep. Because as we would like to have more time, and we do need our um, our mental health is um, very important. That um, what comes with that? Like, what is the mm -hmm. cost? Mm -hmm. And um, oftentimes, I don't know that. Um, that's things that people consider. It's just like, yeah, that sounds good. Let's just do that. But um, we want to do these things, and we want to um, be considered and mindful of the instruction. Yep, absolutely. And um, at the same time, think about the well-being of our staff. So I would like to. Yeah, I was. I was forward. actually going to ask. So you mentioned about the um, effects of instruction. I was going to ask if you, when we do send this out, or when you bring it back to the full board, if we could add as one of our key considerations summertime learning loss. And um, and you know affordability for um, some families to be able to, you know, the extended uh, summertime, being able to provide childcare and um, academic opportunities or camp like type of things for for everybody. It's not the same here in Montgomery County for every group of people. Uh, Mr. Kim. Um. One clarifying question, those professional early release days, right, are those reflected in these drafts? And if so, I'm just having a hard time, like, picking the apart the, the color code. Yeah. They're the yellow yeah. ones. Okay. No, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, there's, there's fewer of them than we've seen in the okay. past because we added those full professional development days. But the yellow ones are those. I, the only caveat I would say, though, is in every one of these scenarios, um, in the month of November, there's always two yellow ones. Mm -hmm. uh, they also represent days that we use as conference days um, for families um, with, with schools. So they are still half days for students, but just what it looks like in terms of uh, the workload for uh, an instructor or a teacher may be a little bit different. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to ask about so, so this calendar year, having those three holidays on weekends does afford us, you know, that opportunity to perhaps be more creative. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke to perhaps there being a, a risk of setting a precedence that we can't follow. But I'm wondering, you know, what really are the repercussions of setting a precedence or, or trying something even knowing that it might not look the same next year? I feel like by the very nature of the calendar, it's going to fluctuate year mm -hmm. to year. Um, so why not maximize the benefits when we can? Uh, even if we can't next year, it's yeah. not to say that two years from now, three years from now, we might not be able to explore you know, similar options. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, you know, maybe what are some of those repercussions that we're not considering? Um, and, and if no, that's... actually your thinking is, is genius I, yeah. in, in many ways, and, and I'll tell you why. Like, for example, I think one of the reasons we ended up landing on the two days early is is this a way to softly walk into potentially starting a full week earlier in mm -hmm. the future if we had to, mm -hmm. right? So the idea of like, I, I just can't fit it in at some future date. And I don't know what year that is. That may be 2024, 25, um, or 25, 26. Um, but that piece of it. Uh, the other piece, though, that we're always thinking of, and, and you know, I appreciate that um, our, our chief operating officer, uh, Mr. Hall is, is in the audience because we have to always consider the cost. And so when I extend days, for example, professional development days, and I'm adding that to the work schedule of staff, um, that does then cost more money, um, particularly if they are used to a contract that says, I work 195 days, and it seems like you have expanded this calendar to go way, way beyond that. Uh, the way that we did this was to still be able to land um, on those numbers, um, but when we get to another year that, let's just say, four of those five holidays 
needed to be in some way aligned to a professional development or something, then I think the, the, the other side of it is either um, individuals will feel like it is not a professional development day for them because they want to take off because they actually may be someone who observes that mm -hmm. um, or it will then add on days and someone says the only way to get that in is now you've taken me past 195 days mm -hmm. if we're talking about contract aspects and, and then that becomes a whole different conversation um, and, and piece that we have to consider uh, as a board in the school district. Mm -hmm. But just for clarity all four of these calendar options um, fulfill the agreed upon number of days for staff and the required state mandated number of days for students. They do. Yes. Okay. And we covered that sports wouldn't change. And um, yeah, I think that we should send them all out unless anyone has any other questions, comments, concerns. No. I think we should send it off. Okay. Great. Yeah, uh, I agree. Um, I just wanted to. Yeah, please. Um, perhaps it'll it'll, uh, for example, like um, a mo like a weekly half day model that that other districts across the nation's employ. Not to say that we should have a half day every week, but things like that 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 truly maybe thinking um, really far out of the box from mm -hmm. what we have are only possible. Um, perhaps to implement when we have the opportunity, like those three kind of wiggle room days. Um, so I'm wondering, with given the constraints of, of meeting those agreed upon days, and and um, if we start school as early as we can and, and end as late as we can, and maybe minimize some of those breaks we're thinking of uh, extending to, to long, because you know I do think that after a certain point, the benefits of having a break one day longer, two day longer, become increasingly marginal. Um, Point being that um, perhaps maximizing the days we have and then throwing in those um, professional days or, or early release days or non-instructional days, system-wide closures, um, could be possible in a way that you know we still might have some of those benefits that school districts that do mm -hmm. have a weekly half day have. Um, so you know, given the constraints we have, uh, I wonder to what extent that would be possible. Mr. Kim, I thank you for bringing that up, and I'll tell you why, because it reminds me of um, when we were in the pandemic mm -hmm. and we had the Wednesdays. Right. And mm -hmm. so we often hear that, especially in committee groups, of how beneficial that time was, um, not because it was not direct, because not because it was wasn't connected with direct instruction, but it gave an opportunity to make the connection with the learning for what the student needed at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and it allowed an opportunity for staff to engage with children in a different way. So this calendar does give us some flexibility in creating some options. Um, and, and as you say that, it also uh, takes us back to how do we create the level of consistency? Because that's what the calendar brings to folks as well. So in hearing that, that is a piece that we can go back and really think about offering the consistency, considerations for what we can work within the confines of, of the school year and the structures that we have here. Okay. Well, so if nobody has anything else that they want to add, Mr. Hollis, do you have anything else that you wanted to add? You're good? No, it's a great joy. <laughs> okay. Um, I will say, I will uh, recommend that we move all four calendars forward. Um, I would also like to ask that we leave the survey open um, and until the 24th, October 24th. Um, if that's not, if, if that's enough time for you to be able to put together the results for the meeting on the 25th, or maybe we should say the 23rd, close on the 23rd. Uh, I, I just think with the, um, the, the with respect to just giving the public an opportunity to see it, I, I do think that the 24th does make it tight. Um, okay. Or the board will, the public will see something on the website that shows an earlier kind of closure mm -hmm. versus a, a PowerPoint that may show um, updated numbers. And and so I don't. So well, we can close it whenever you. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'll leave it up to you guys to decide. My main thing is is that. 
when we normally put them out for public comment, we put them out and we have a little description and I'm hopeful we'll include the key considerations and things like that. But um, I would like to make sure that the survey aspect is also included, if that's possible, if that makes sense. I just want to make sure that we're getting representation from mm. all stakeholders and not just one or two groups who pay attention to the fact that we had this meeting today and or that we're having the meeting on the 25th and then we put it out for three weeks for public comment. So however we do that, I'll leave to you. I just, again, I want to make sure that we're really hearing, getting those voices that we aren't seeing showing up right here in this statistical. No, absolutely. Um, and we'll do much of that through some direct engagement with people, okay. like walking through the scenario similar to what we've done here today with the board. Okay. So we'll have the survey available for people who maybe can't make it to direct engagement. You're not a part of a certain group mm -hmm. and you're able to access it that way. And then in that, we're in that phase three block anyway. Mm -hmm. So now we sit and we actually talk about those. So we'll have a mix of each. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, do we need a vote to move them forward? I don't think so, right? We just can just move them forward since we all agree. Um, so with that, I will thank uh, Mr. Hollis again. Wish him a happy belated birthday. I think yesterday was a big was birthday day. So yeah, Close. we should That's sing. Wonderful. We should sing. We should oh, sing. We should no, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> we should have his little birthday monkey. <laughs> that would be a great policy management right? committee. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, thank you all very much for your time. I appreciate it. And um, look forward to having a really <laughs> robust discussion to Ms. Evans' point uh, with the full board. So thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, moving along, um, we are up to item number five which was the annual update on the implementation of policy JHC, the Child Abuse and Neglect. For some background, um, policy JHC requires that the superintendent present an annual report of cases, implementation strategies, and any other updates in relation to child abuse and neglect. Um, we're receiving that report today and are gonna hear uh, a little bit about some initiatives and enhancements that MCPS is exploring for the next upcoming 2023 school year. Um, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Sally and um, go from there. Okay. So joining me now Mrs. at the Davis, table. Sorry. That's okay. okay. Uh, joining me now at the table is Mrs. Michael Simmons, the Director of Depli uh, Department of Compliance and Investigations. And joining us in the audience is Ms. Kathy Green. Uh, senior Specialist in the Office of Student Welfare and Compliance. And Ms. Simmons will be presenting the annual update on the implementation of policy JHC on behalf of the Department of Compliance and Investigations as well as Student Welfare and Compliance. Great. So, next slide, please. All right. Um, good afternoon. Um, policy JHC requires an annual reporting outlining specific data um, associated with reports of suspected child abuse and neglect by MCPS employees, contractors, and um, our volunteers. Next slide, please. The, imp the implementation of policy JHC also um, requires a component for staff training. In FY22, all staff completed an 11-module district-wide mandatory compliance training. Um, we also um, in fiscal year um, 2022, the existing compliance training modules were updated to reflect the Board of Education um, amendments to board policy ACF, sexual misconduct, sexual harassment of students, and new board policy ACI, which is sexual harassment um, of Montgomery County Public Schools employees. Examples of module updates include applied scenarios involving Title IX sexual harassment um, and incidents of hate, of hate bias and implications for MCPS mental health professionals, including uh, school-based student welfare liaisons, school counselors, pupil personnel workers, school psychologists, social workers, and behavioral specialists. Finally, human trafficking guidance was inserted into the gangs and gang behavior module 
of the district-wide mandatory compliance training. Next slide. The data below demonstrates the renewal of volunteer training efforts after lower volunteer participation in MCPS schools in FY21 um, due to COVID. So we've bounced back to our previous um, training numbers. Next slide. Uh, we're really excited about the collaboration with county partner agencies and the greater community. Um, I'll highlight some of those here. Um, the Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services, or Child War Welfare, held a 2022 stakeholders meeting to provide county partner agencies updates on assessments, data, um, on calls screened, accepted reports, in-home and out-of-home services for families. We also continue our collaboration with the University of Maryland Support Advocacy Freedom and Empowerment Center to enhance human trafficking awareness training and training for our health educators in our secondary schools and this year we will be expanding the training in this area to school-based personnel and administrators and counselors. Um, also, we continue with MCPS Pride Alliance for Students, Safe, Par Safe Staff, Parents, and County LGBTQ plus partner agencies um, was established to promote exclusiv inclusivity and curriculum, create a safe atmosphere in schools, expand professional development for staff, and strengthen partnerships in the community. Next slide. During FY22, 3,750 suspected incidents of child abuse or neglect were reported by MCPS staff volunteers or contractors to CPS or Adult Protective Services. Um, of course, this levels out based on numbers previous to COVID. Next slide. So outcomes of CPS reports involving MCPS employees um, were at 75. Um, of those, 55 were screened out, 12 were ruled out, one was unsubstantiated, and seven were indicated. There was one for volunteers, and that one was screened out. Next slide. When CPS concludes their investigations, MCPS conducts investigations, internal investigations into the conduct, possible conduct violations um, in accordance with any of our policies or regulations. Um, 29 of our employee cases was determined that there were no actions warranted. Um, 37, there were conferences or memos to the record. Um, for four, there were reprimands. Um, and there were five where there was a removal from employment. Next slide. So the superintendent may request suspension or revocation of certificates by, to the state. Um, and ultimately it is the state's determination. However, we do um, make those recommendations. Um, there were, in FY22, there were three revocation requests for employees dismissed for sexual misconduct with a student. There were two revocation requests after criminal charges of alleged sexual misconduct were found. Um, there were two suspension requests for misconduct um, involving a student. Next slide. So in closing, this is where um, Mr. Smondrowski discussed um, possible um, enhancements and um, initiatives and Greg made sure that I, he said, read them all, read every last one. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'll do my best, Greg. <laughs> so um, we will continue to collaborate with the Montgomery County Interagency Coordinating Board or ICB to establish and enact safety measures and procedures that are aligned to MCPS expectations for ICB contracted users in the buildings. We will revise the culture of respect student training module to elevate student awareness regarding signs of neglect, abuse, and harassment. We will continue to monitor online reporting processes for suspected online child abuse and neglect cases and expand 
the, imp the implementation procedures countywide. We will enhance the training plan for our student welfare liaisons and school-based critical staff, providing staff development training plans and refresher training for staff in schools. And finally, we will monitor the implementation of revised personal body safety lessons at all levels based on student feedback and input. That being said, I will turn it back over to you. So we are ready for your discussion and questions. Okay, so I'm going to open it up to my colleagues, um, and I just want to remind them that this is basically just our annual re compliance report, um, and no action will be needed or taken. So does anyone have any questions, comments, or thoughts? Dr. Daka? Yeah. Uh, when we talk about screened out as uh, opposed to ruled out, does screened out mean that there wasn't enough information gathered or... No, so the screening process, all of the reports that go into CPS, they have, uh, they make a determination of whether or not, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so when those cases are called into CPS, they make the determination as to whether those cases, they will investigate. So those are, those are ones that are screened out. Oh, so we make that determination. We no, don't make CPS that. CPS does. makes oh, that CPS determination. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. CPS yes. makes that. Okay. And when it's ruled out, then the when, materials didn't. So when it's ruled yeah. out, that means that they have investigated, yeah. and in that investigation, they have not determined that that, indi in, that, that individual should be indicated or for neglect or abuse. Okay. And revocation and suspension, the difference there. So the revocation and suspension is for, um, like, immorality, um, those cases where individuals... Oh, okay, the difference between the certificate. I'm sorry, you're talking about the difference between the two? Yeah, the, yeah, the okay. actions that we're taking. So if for individuals, uh, just as an example, for individuals who were, um, we found um, misconduct and they were um, also indicated for sex abuse of a child, um, there's a request for revocation of their teaching certificate, meaning they, we would, um, they would take it away, exactly, they would take it away. <laughs> um, MSDE makes that determination. We do not. We just request the revocation. <coughs> and suspension? And for, sus for do suspension. Do or do they do it? They do it. All of the revocation or suspension of certificates is a request by the superintendent to the state superintendent who then makes the determination. So they, they determine whether it's a revocation <coughs> or a suspension? Correct. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Thank and to, for clarification, there are times that we've requested suspension and they have reviewed the facts and just determined that it oh. should be revoca a revocation. So. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, does anyone have any other clarifying questions? No? All right. Well, thank you very much for this. Appreciate your work on it. Okay. And we will look forward to the next update. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, next item up is item six, policy um, ACI, sexual harassment of employees. So um, <coughs> next we're going to take a look at a few technical amendments to policy ACI. These amendments need to be made in order to reflect some organizational changes that have occurred within MCPS. And with that, I will turn it over to staff. Ms. Davis. Okay. So joining us is now uh, Ms. Danielle Miller, who is the assistant general counsel in the office of the general counsel and she has been just invaluable to us on all the work related to policy ACI as well as the work we're doing on creating the regulation of implementing uh, procedures so um, as you will recall policy ACI was created by the board um, to specifically address uh, um, sorry we are on there is not a slideshow for this one TV so okay. that one okay um, there we go in June 2021, the board created policy ACI as a new policy. Um, and as Mrs. Mandrowski said, we need some technical amendments. So you will recall from policy BSA policy setting <coughs> that the policy management committee may recommend that the board adopt technical amendments when the proposed amendments update directory information, which means office names or office names, office names that are no longer exist, and that's the situation here. And such technical amendments may be adopted immediately by the board mm -hmm. upon the recommendation of the policy management committee. So that is what we're here to do today. Mm -hmm. So um, I can 
quickly take you through these and see if you have any further questions. But if we can jump to page seven, um, you'll see the kind of just straight out office change we're talking about. Um, but then if you, there's, I, I do want to make a note on the previous page about, if we can back Is up to page, page five. five. Yeah. yeah. So um, similarly, we've updated office names. We've just done a little reorganization here because mm -hmm. what we are uh, doing here is that um, the, the draft amendments clarify that the reports go directly to DCI, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and really, that is all we are trying to do with this, this update. So I can pause there, but we're ready for your questions and any discussion you may have on this. I, I do not have any uh, questions or concerns. Um, Mr. Kim, are you good with this? I know this is your first uh, technical amendment one, so. I'm trying to find the papers. Oh, <laughs> here. There you go. Pass that to me. Mrs. Mandrowski, I just wanted to mm -hmm. add one more thing. So we sure. are working on messaging to staff so they know the correct right. information. Good. And we are getting that messaging out in advance of, I mean, not in advance of, but we are working on that now. It will be in the Employee Code of Conduct, it will be on the right website, and we are working on this this regulation, will, which will have the right, and, I was and say, some it'll more. It'll be in the regulations as uh, well Yeah, as and it'll, there'll be a little bit more information to help staff find these things. So other than the change in title of the office to report to, there are no other changes to the reporting process itself. Is that correct? We did previously have the option for um, the, it, the the employee still retains the option to go and talk to anybody they want to go talk to, mm -hmm. but um, DCI would like to get those reports directly. They do not want the principals trying to deal with these. Mm -hmm. They want them going straight. So From that is something we have updated as well. Oh, okay. So that I wasn't aware that that was changing. Okay. No, so is that a correct representation of it? So there's no an, uh, anonymity in anything possible. Uh, well, well, I know sometimes people don't want to, they want the system to be aware, but they don't necessarily want to, right, they want to be anon you know, anonymous because, you know, they're not sure if it qualifies or, you know, um, and don't want to. They just want somebody to look into it. Is that possible? They can still do that. Okay. But, um, but yeah, let's look to now speak. Sure. So there's always the option for an individual to call DCI okay. and speak to somebody on the telephone without revealing their identity okay. or indicating their name or where they work. Um, so that's always an option. And again, this is to clarify, this is reporting information mm -hmm. and it's upon that report that DCI does an intake to evaluate if it would move forward into that investigative stage. And so, yes, that that ability to make an anonymous report, and even so, if someone wanted to do an email address that wasn't necessarily an MCPS email address, they could still send that. But telephone okay. would be the best way for somebody to either make that anonymous report or to engage with DCI staff to discuss what would this look like if it went forward to an investigation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anybody have any questions or comments? So um, we are going to move this then to the full board to take the vote. And I know we don't because it's just a technical amendment. It doesn't go out for public comment or anything. I just want to clarify whether or not we need to vote to move it to the full board or if we just propose that we move it to the full board. Great. Okay. Well, then I am going to propose that we move this on to the full board. And thank you all very much. Oh, okay. No worries. Thank you. Okay. Last but not least, <laughs> we are up to item number seven. Uh, this is a discussion of informational meetings that were held on the renaming of schools um, through policy FFA. God bless you. Um, again, a little bit of background. Um, this is just a report. There will be no action taken. Um, but in 2019, the board passed a resolution requesting that MCPS engage with six school communities to determine whether or not there was interest in changing school names. This request was based on historical research 
conducted regarding the namesakes for these schools and concerns that board members heard from the community about some of those school names. Um, since then, the renaming process included in policy FFA has also been amended. The amended policy was adopted by the full board in June of 2022. Um, when the amended policy was adopted, the board um, directed MCPS to conduct community engagement opportunities for the purpose of informing each of the communities from these six schools um, of the amendment of the renaming process <laughs> so that everybody could be aware and all on the same page. Um, the board directed MCPS to report back to the policy management committee no later than the fall of 22, and here we are. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you all to fill us in on how that's all going. So joining me now at the table are Mr. Everett Davis, mm -hmm. the Director of Student, Family, and School Services, and Ms. Frances Frost, Associate to the, uh, Assistant to the Associate Superintendent, Office of Wellbeing, Learning, and Achievement. Um, we do want to acknowledge some key colleagues there, yes. Uh, <laughs> joining us in the audience is Mr. Darwin Wong, Coordinator of Equity Initiatives Unit, who was a powerhouse behind uh, nice. the planning. <laughs> And in addition, we would also like to acknowledge our colleagues, uh, Mr. Steve Neff and mm -hmm. Ms. Danielle Wilson-Sadler for assisting with the community meetings. And also, we'd like to acknowledge the contributions of staff from the Montgomery County Historical Society, who yes. prepared the analysis mm -hmm. uh, in your packets, but also attended meetings. It and, was a great analysis. And provided that um, impartial, professional, historical background to the meetings. Mm -hmm. So with that, I will turn it to Mr. Everett Davis. Thank you, Ms. Davis, and good afternoon uh, to our board members. Just excited to be here this afternoon to be able to share a little bit of an update with you. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please, around our policy FFA, naming our school facilities. Thank you. So the purpose of the policy, as I think you've heard Ms. Mondrowski uh, shared, uh, was really to establish the board's responsibility for naming our MCPS schools and facilities and also to set forth the criteria uh, by which the names are evaluated. And just to share a little bit within this policy is the process to both name uh, new school facilities as well as to rename existing ones. We can go to the next slide, please. So the purpose of the community meetings, just to share a little bit with you, and I know Ms. Mondrowski shared in, in her opening, uh, as the board directed in the June 7th uh, final action policy, FFA, we were conducting community engagement to inform the six identified school communities of the process of renaming. And you can see those six communities uh, listed there, four of our high schools, Magruder, Wooten, Blair, uh, and also Richard Montgomery, as well as two of our middle schools, Key and Poole. And I've had the fortune of attending uh, three of those thus mm -hmm. far. We have one remaining, which, which you'll hear more about. Um, but I can just say we really appreciated hearing from the community uh, as we move forward, and we'll, and we'll go into a little bit more detail about that. Uh, we, I would just reference the final action memo again from June the 7th, and I won't read that to you. But again, as Ms. Mondrowski shared, it just really says that we will engage our six communities and report back to the, to the board as we are right now. Um, there were, just to share a little bit, uh, three main categories that I'll go through in talking about the rest of this slide uh, our community meetings, also engaging our principal and school staff, uh, engagement and preparation, as well as the historical biographies. So just a little bit around our community meetings, we did have, as you heard, uh, Ms. Davis outline our staff from Wellbeing, Learning, and Achievement, as well as Equity, Mr. Wong, uh, and as well as our partnership with Montgomery History to review the biography of the school's namesake. Uh, all meetings were held virtually, and they were scheduled for an hour. Most of them did not take that long, uh, but we were very thorough and efficient as we went through. And the information, just to give you an idea of what each of those meetings look like, we provide an overview of the renaming process. Uh, we provide a summary of slavery in Montgomery County and a biographical summary, which I saw some head nods about that you have seen, as well as a sample petition uh, illustrating the required information for a petition to give them an idea of what that would look like. Uh, we also allow time for questions, whether it be via chat, via Q&A, uh, and all of the slides and the materials that, that were shared, uh, I know that you have in your meeting materials there to review. 
as well as at the end of the time together, we did ask them to complete a short survey by the QR code, try to make it as easy and user-friendly as possible, as well as drop that information in the chat for them uh, to give us an idea. As I said, we're, we're up to um, our, our final meeting coming up, but to really process adjust as we went along, so we use that feedback uh, to do so as we move forward. And so we also leverage the work of our Equity Initiatives Unit. I know we can't say it enough about Mr. Wong and his support, the support of his team, uh, really to, to put forward that this is equity work uh, and it aligns very closely uh, with not only the core values but our charge as a school system. So we wanted to make sure that that was clear uh, during our meetings, that they were informative, accessible, and also that they were unbiased. The next category I'd like to talk about was uh, how we engaged our principals and school staff. Um, as we planned for the community meetings, we were very intentional, including our school administration, uh, making sure that they were prepared. We know that they are our front lines and often the, the credible messengers um, where our, our families would go to first. So we wanted to make sure that they were shored up with this information, uh, as well as any potential questions that they might receive. So we met with them on September 8th, as well as on September the 13th. Uh, we, we met with them and as well as their planning committees, which in, often included the principals, uh, additional school staff, uh, as well as the directors that, that support and oversee the schools, uh, just to prep them for those meetings and any questions, potential questions that they might receive. <laughs> then we work closely with the principals to select a date for the school community uh, within September and October. As I said, we're still moving through one more school. Uh, and schools are provided with the information around those community meetings, flyers, um, additional resources, et cetera. We really wanted to minimize um, the, the amount of, of uh, chores or work that the schools had to do. We really wanted to make sure that we were uh, helping to facilitate that process as we know that there's a lot going on with our, our schools and principals, so we wanted to make sure that we assume that, as well as we prepared an FAQs uh, for the principals to help to respond to any questions that they might receive. And then lastly, uh, I'd like to speak about the historical biographies. Uh, again, you've heard, and we can't say it enough, our partners from Montgomery History who have been with us from the planning. Uh, they joined us actually in the meetings as well, the preparation, uh, just were a great resource to help us as we move forward. Uh, and so they, they presented the historical history as a part of that actual meeting. They were virtually with us. And I just wanted to make sure I called them out also. I know Ms. Davis did, but called them out by name. Uh, Mr. Buglass, Ralph Buglass, as well as Mr. Matt Logan, uh, who were with us for, for the vast majority, if not either of them, representing at each of the five. And they will be with us at the sixth uh, meeting as well. So just, again, appreciate them being there to support us, presenting an unbiased perspective, um, and, and really helping us to interpret uh, and, and set the record straight for what the history uh, in Montgomery County was, uh, again, from a, a credible messenger. So having said that, I'm going to turn the presentation over now to Ms. Frost. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, next slide, please. You'll see the schedule of meetings that we've had with the schools. As Mr. Davis said, we've had five already, and we have Montgomery Blair as the last one, which will be next Thursday evening at 6.30, also on Zoom. Um, each school community received flyers for their principals to distribute by email, newsletter, and other ways that the um, principal determine works for um, his or her community. So in addition to these community meetings, we've also heard from the principals that they've been having informal conversations within their school building with their school um, students and with their staff about the meetings, about the content, about the idea of changing their school name. So we've um, provided them FAQs, as Mr. Davis said, and we feel that they were very prepped for the discussions and they've indicated that they felt ready um, given our pre-meeting and our FAQs and making sure they have an understanding of what's going on. So while we've had these meetings, um, we've had about 125 people who have attended thus far to those five <coughs> meetings. Um, we issued a survey during those meetings and asked uh, <coughs> participants to complete a short survey. So we've only had about uh, 30 people who've completed those surveys, um, just as a, a indication of those who've attended the meetings. Um, about half of them, or more than half, I should say, are parents and students who've attended those meetings, bless you, and uh, about a third have been MCPS staff. And some of those staff are 
um, those who are school-based and part of the planning team, but um, some of them are teachers who are working in the school and want to know what's going on in the school. Um, so we've had parents of attending and we've had um, high school and middle school students who've attended and completed the survey. Um, and then from a uh, cultural background, we've had um, most of our participants have been white and um, the others have represented our African American, Asian, Latino, and multiracial communities. So, um, we're there. We've, had, we've also had comments about the um, why people are attending the meetings. That was part of the survey. Um, and there were some who said that they were coming just for information. They wanted to know what it was about. We have had some um, parents who said they wanted to come because their children attended and they, again, wanted to be informed. Um, and similarly to some comments from staff for the same reason. And then there were some who came because they were actually interested in submitting a petition to rename their school and wanted to find out information about how to do that. And those petitions, as Mr. Davis said, we do have a sample on the website for those who are interested. Um, next slide. So we collaborated with our fantastic communications team and they helped to um, make sure that the schools had the resources and materials that they needed to share this information and for us to hear from the community as well. So they created a web page um, specifically about this process and on that web page there are links for um, the historical background of each of the namesakes, the summary of slavery in Montgomery County and a sample petition. Um, as of this past Monday afternoon, we had 50 web views to that web page. Um, EGPS created flyers for each of the school communities with links on them and digital QR codes so the principals could distribute those and post those in their schools. And then um, we created an email drop box. Again, we wanted to make sure that our principals were not flooded with questions and then had this additional task of having to answer the questions. So we, pro we created a um, drop box that's listed there, community input, um, and encourage people to send their messages there, um, hopefully to hopefully to reduce some of the messages going to their principals. Um, as of today, we've only had two messages um, to that mailbox, but we are monitoring it to make sure that we answer questions that may come through there. Um, and then of course we emphasize to the attendees of the meeting that if they are going to um, submit a petition that that should come directly to you, to the Board of Education, not to their principal or to this Dropbox, which of course we would forward to you, but it should come directly to you so that they understand the use of those different emails. Um, and I think that is it. I'll turn it back over to Mr. Davis. Thank you, Ms. Frost. And we can go to the next slide, please. So just as Ms. Frost shared, we are um, coming to the culmination of our, our road show, we'll call it, uh, with, with Blair, as you saw there on the schedule, uh, coming up on the 27th. And we'll continue to monitor the feedback that we received through the Dropbox. Uh, at this time, we will open it up to questions and to discussion. Sorry. Yep, yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I appreciate the, the work that you guys are putting into this. Um, Ms. Evans? Yes, yeah, so my only question was, do you get from the meetings that our community now has a better understanding of what the process is for renaming? Because I know that um, some are a bit confused as to how that process begins, but did you, were you able to gather that or did that come out at all? That, um, interestingly, is the question that comes up when we do the Q&A in the chat. And we have a chart in there, I think it's in your slides, to um, try to explain the steps because I think there is some unclarity. One, is this process happening right now? Mm -hmm. So we've clarified it is not. Your name is still your name until you know the board makes a decision otherwise. Um, so that is, that is a question that comes up. I think there is some unclarity and that's what we've tried to answer and make clear in the process. It's been mainly, has this process started and when will we know our new name <laughs> comes up as a question. <laughs> yeah. 
And the other piece I would just share too, I think in looking at the data, I, I know Ms. Frost shared with the, the Dropbox that we've received two responses mm -hmm. thus far, and you can look at that one of two ways, of course. Either we're being very thorough, um, which I like to think is, 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 what, is what it <laughs> that's is absolutely in, in the way this we're case, going. <laughs> yes. But, but I just believe that that's additional data that mm -hmm. speaks to um, after they have joined the, the lack of questions that we have received. And, and mm -hmm. also to, uh, you have this in your materials, but also we go through the FAQs. It's not just adding to them. We actually walk them through as a part of the process. Some of the FAQs that we have received, that's actually a part of the presentation. That's good because they're good questions. Dr. Daka? Um, I just wanted to know how it went with Odessa Shannon. Did you do the same process? Did you get the same kind of input? This is the renaming of Lee for the audience. Right. Okay, so oh, you're talking about historical. She's referring to the process that we went through in terms of renaming um, Scott uh, 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 Lee uh, Middle School to the Odessa Shannon Middle School. Okay, well, just to clarify, that yeah. this was only about the six schools that came up in the historical analysis, so it was just no, the I, schools. No, I do understand oh, okay, sorry. about those, but I just wondered if there were, if, were there things that happened then that are happening now that you're talking about these six schools, were there protests, were there people who were very happy with it? Mm -hmm. And I realized that Lee was um, not open uh, until recently. I think, Dr. Daka, it's a different situation um, because we're not in that renaming process yet. Oh. We did, however, um, work with, I think it was Dr. Sergo who was on that team, right? Mm -hmm. um, way in the beginning when we started the renaming policy update, we did work with her to for some lessons learned and what happened with Lee and Odessa Shannon so that we could incorporate that into our planning for this process. That's why I asked the question, how that went. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I'm just, I'm just gonna say it seems as though, um, to Dr. Doctor's point, around that time, I think one of the reasons um, it came from the board was just because of the, some of the confusion as to the process and just how we go about this. So I do appreciate that um, our staff took this up during the pandemic. I know, and, and so Ms. Davis talked about, we talked about earlier about all the policies that were done. I don't think people quite understand the time that it takes mm -hmm. to do this work. People want a quick turnaround, but there's definitely a process to it. Mm -hmm. And what I do appreciate is, um, at a time when you know a lot of many of our families were food insecure and you know didn't have access to technology that people may not have known the work continued on and so we were doing the mm -hmm. getting all this together right to be able to go out into the community but um i do believe a lot of it yeah. came about because some of the questions that the community had and just the misunderstanding to the process and just wanted to kind of just take everybody through it from beginning to end to help them well, also clarifying the fact that we we amended our policy, sure. and so making sure that everybody understood the um, the new processes and, and the new requirements mm -hmm. through our policy. Yeah. So um, I'm assuming that that's all been discussed as well as yeah. big portion mm -hmm. of the the meetings that you've been having. So we appreciate that very much. Which is why we probably only maybe have we two should emails. do that about all yeah. of our policies. No, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> And then even having the um, the email to take some of yeah. the burden off of like our that. administrators, and yep. I'm sure they're probably still getting emails, but at least there's something um, different. You know, uh, there's a, also another avenue that our community can go through to get their mm -hmm. questions asked. So that was a different approach, and I appreciate that. I actually really like that, and I was thinking myself, um, I wonder if we'll keep that up for people to be able to participate with other concerns or community f feedback opportunities or if it's targeted strictly for this but you know there's we've got the ask mcps but i think sometimes people when they just want to give some feedback they don't realize like that they're not asking a question so they don't go to the ask mcps and um but it's a it seems like a really uh potentially positive way for people to be able to provide comments and feedback to the system on areas of concern without having to send stuff directly to school administrators or um you know even our office um, and give you guys the opportunity to respond. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for the efforts that have been put in. We look forward to getting further information at the conclusion. I don't know if there will be another update or if we just are going to complete the final meeting and then we wait to see if anything happens and if it doesn't, 
it doesn't, and if it does, we take it up from there. Is that pretty much, I mean, that's how I assumed it was going to be, is that there would not be further fee uh, <laughs> follow ups, but. We didn't. We we can certainly provide what no. you would like, but no, this was okay. intentionally the the re, the reporting back as Great. requested. Okay, thank you very much. You nope, know, we appreciate it, and um, thanks for your time. Mm -hmm. okay. So, with that, that brings us to our final um, item: adjournment. <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts, comments, or concerns from my colleagues? <laughs> Nope. Well, then I will move to adjourn. Thank you.